Who are the big winners and losers in the latest MBN Fibre Lottery? And how can you best avoid MyGov tax time scams? Vertical Hold is proudly brought to you by Uniden Australia. Hi there. Welcome back to Vertical Hold, Behind the Tech News the award-winning tech podcast where we catch up with Australia's leading tech journalists and commentators to dive into the big tech stories of the week. I'm Alex Kidman, joined as usual by Adam Turner. Hey Adam, Nokia Networks, that's the network company, not the guys who make the current Nokia phones, that's HMT Global, but Nokia Networks this week announced that it's hoping by the end of the year to launch a 4G network. Now, that might not sound all that exciting, but this is a 4G network on the moon. On the moon. Awesome. Adam, if you were the first man to text on the moon, what would your message be? Uh, Three words. Send more bourbon. (sighs) Gee, I hope you've got your your lunar roaming uh, plan activated. Otherwise, that bourbon's going to cost you a lot. What I want to know, though, is if it's the Nokia network, does that mean I need to bash it out on a keypad with predictive text, old school? (laughs) Because that Look, could take a, a while. It might be an idea just to survive the lunar conditions. Maybe. Just maybe. And that's presuming, of course, the network actually stands up because we're also joined by a man who, I'm quietly confident, could cause that 4G moon network to crash just by standing near it. From Finder, it's Angus Kidman. G'day, g'day, g'day. <laughs> so, Gus, how much would Nokia have to pay you not to board that lunar mission? Well, see, this is the problem. I was inspired many years ago as a child by Astro Smurf, so I'm determined to get on the moon. So if Nokia doesn't want me up there ruining it, they're going to have to cough up the really big butts. This sounds like a great business model. I'm in as your PR agent. But, in fact, we are not here to concoct wacky and possibly evil mastermind schemes. We're here this week to talk about scams and how to avoid them. But first... Back to our soup du jour, and it hasn't actually been our soup du jour for a while. Regular listeners will know what I'm talking about. New listeners will be going, soup? Is this a soup podcast? Did we listen to the wrong thing? No, you didn't. Our soup du jour here at Vertical Hold for the longest time has been the National Broadband Network and NBN Co. And they had some big headlines with some big numbers of people that can get big speeds. What's the story here, Gus? Well, they, they have announced that you can now officially start applying to get upgraded to fibre. So if you're in one of sort of 2 million homes that are currently sitting on uh, fibre to the node or fibre to the curb, you can now find out if you're eligible for an upgrade. And if you're eligible for an upgrade, you then apply to your ISP to say, I want an upgrade. And then they send out a truck and it does something and eventually you get higher speeds. So this is, it's new that you can apply for this. This is not a new announcement. I think the first announcement that they intended to do this go back something like two years, I think, possibly longer. It was 2020 when they first said, hey, we're going to give people this ability to selectively upgrade themselves. But now that moment has arrived and yay, woohoo, we're so excited. Except I'm not excited because I can't get it. So as far as I'm concerned, it's completely irrelevant because if I can't get it, who cares what's happening to the other 2 million people? So they're saying that it's now going to cover 75% of homes on the MBN. So who does that leave? I'm guessing that the people left out are HFC cable, satellite and fixed wireless? No, so it's satellite and fixed wireless is the big chunk of it. it this new 2 million does leave out some of the people who are right. This is not everybody who's on fibre of the node or fibre of the curve because there are about 2.8 million of those according to the most recent numbers. And they're saying about 2 million people can do this. So there's 800,000 people there that have been thrown out. HFC is on a separate trajectory where they're saying, okay, they're continuing to upgrade that network so everyone will be able to get gigabit speed. So when they're doing these high levels of things, they're counting most people on HFC. Just just to interrupt for a second, I believe with the HFC network, or at least the last time I talked to me and Co about it, their claim was actually 100% of the HFC network can now do that. They've actually finished that. And when you say can, you you mean can now offer gigabit speeds, not can can be be replaced with fibre to your house. Correct, yes, sorry. To, to, To absolutely clarify, the last statement I had from MDN Co was that 100% of the HFC footprint could apply for gigabit plans through their ISP, and that doesn't require an upgrade process from the consumer side whatsoever, although, as happened in my case when I applied for it, gee, it, it did require an awful lot of jiggling around of cables and them working out what was going on at the time, but that was before they were at the 100% level, so maybe it's a bit better now. Yeah, I bet it's not. I could not put enough <laughs> money on it. I, 
I, I'm on HFC myself, and we are still on monthly day-long maintenance outages just to keep the standard service going. So while I'm pretty sure that in that high, when they're trying to say, hey, everyone's got access to high speeds, they're bundling everybody into that set. Yeah, I take that with the proverbial MBN co-sized grain of salt because, yeah, it's one thing to say we've got the network. It's another thing to say that we're maintaining the network or running it well. The other catch here, though, and we have talked about this before. You, you're right. This is not a new story. Is that in order to get, if you're on fiber to the node, the worst of the fixed line technologies for the NBN, if you're on fiber to the node, you can get this upgrade to fiber to the premises, which is more, st- or technologically should be more stable, should be better. But in order to get that, you have to punch up the speed tiers. It's, it's like 100 meg minimum, isn't it? If you're not already there. Yes, that's the thing. If you want to do it, they're not going to do it just for the sake of you saying you've got more reliability. You have to be saying, look, I want the speed. So for people who are kind of relatively happy sitting on 50, which is still you know the majority of the market at the moment, um, yeah, you're going to have to be willing to do that. That, of course, means you're going to have to be willing to spend more money. And that does seem like a fairly extravagant ask in the current straightened economic time, shall we say. So whether or not, now, yeah, I certainly don't think there's going to be a surge of 2 million households saying, wow, I want to apply for this. And if there were, that'd be bad news because they're not going to all get it at the same time. Mm. <laughs> but if you can go up from 50 to 100 to get this, that's still an improvement on the old days because I'm pretty sure when they started talking about this, you had to ask for a plan that was faster than 100 before they do this. I don't think that's right, but off the top of my head, I'm not 100% sure. I it thought was very was, vague. They were was, very vague on the details. It was super clear. And yeah. the other thing that strikes me about this, that they've, they've made this big announcement, and it does lead me to wonder at what level are they kind of bricking it thinking, hang on, times are tough. People aren't going to want to spend. We'd better hype this up to try and make sure we can keep that classic old ARPU, the average revenue per user, going up because that's, you know, MBN Co's bottom line. Yes, there's no doubt. In a general sense, yes, MBN would like everyone to buy higher speeds. That makes them more money. But I also think there's an element in announcing this, they have to look like, okay, we're trying to give our RSPs more chance to actually sell decent services because the reputation of, you know, what they're actually offering, the way they're selling it, has you know, been coming in for a bit of a hammering for yeah, well, decades really, but it's not getting any better. And there's been some recent evidence of that too. So they're complaining the RSP. So that's your retailers, your Telstra's, your Optus's of the world. They're complaining that it's getting harder and harder for them to make any money out of this because they're getting squeezed by MBN, yes? Yes. And I mean, and this leads us into the fantastically complicated world. Like, you know, the the MBN, one of the reasons this is our soup du jour is because it's so confusing and nobody knows what the recipe is. No one knows how that actual soup is put together. But yeah, in the model that they use, which yeah involves CVC, no one likes it except possibly MBN Co itself. Everyone else thinks it's terrible. And right now the complaint is that it's almost impossible to sell plans reliably because everything's been frozen. It's been frozen because what's known as the special access undertaking, which is what MBN does so that it's not completely, you know, ripping off all of its wholesalers. That's supposed to be under review. It's They came up with a version. They sent it to the ACCC back in March. The ACCC said, no, we don't actually like this. We, we're going to formally reject it, but you think you can come up with a better version. Then everyone had till the end of May to send in their submissions, and now they're thinking about it again. So who knows when it's actually going to get sorted out. But while it's not getting sorted out, the existing rules apply, and the all the service providers say the existing rules are just not letting them do this in a way that remotely means they can deliver a profit. And if they can't do that, the end result is that some of them are going to exit. And if they all exit, and we, as it is, it's already very concentrated. There's a handful, maybe half a dozen providers dominate. If you get down to two or three providers, then the notion that competition is going to be good for consumers just completely goes out the window. So it's not a good scenario, but I don't see an easy fix coming for it anytime soon. So just to recap in layman's terms what CVC means, this this is my memory of it. Tell me if I've got it wrong. When Telstra goes to MBN and says, Gus has ordered a service, we've got to connect him up, then NBN allocates Telstra a certain amount of bandwidth to support you. And it's not the full 100 meg you might have signed up for because they're relying on the fact that not everybody's using it flat out all the time. So they might allocate, I don't know, 15 meg, 20 meg or whatever and say, this is your CVC. But that is now stuck at a certain rate. And if you use more than that, they have to pay extra. And they want it over time for that you know, standard allowance to grow, but it's not growing, is it? Which means uh, people like Telstra and Optus are having to go back and buy more and more data to, of bandwidth to actually support their customers. Yes, that's pretty much what it is. Um, to, yeah, to stick with our metaphor, and because it's the way I used to try and explain CVC to people, you've got to think of it as like a gigantic bowl of soup. 
and they bought enough soup that they hope will mean everyone can eat whenever they want to eat, but they know that everyone doesn't eat 24 hours a day. So they want to buy just enough soup to get away with it and not pay any more for the standard bowl of soup. But mm. what's happened is that the standard bowl of soup has been held at a certain size for a while. They would like the standard offering. Of, yeah, they'd like to be getting the big bulk saucepan of soup available as standard without paying extra. And at the moment, that's not happening. So at some point, you know, the soup wars are really going to kick in. Because people's usage continues to go up. Yes, and who would have thunk it? Like you know, when, <laughs> all those years of people saying you'll never need more of these fees. The one thing we know about yeah. network consumption is it always goes up. The demand is there. There's been a kind of permanent shift with people working at home. So all of this stuff leads us to believe that yeah, there, yeah. Then I think everyone agrees that there needs to be a better model. But getting agreement on what a better model is that will be approved by the regulator that MBN Co is willing to suggest in the first place and that, you know, ultimately the government's willing to back has proven to be a slow and tedious process and clearly ha has at least another year to run, I would say, before we get any real change. And even then there would be existing contracts, so they would have to be renegotiated. So none of this stuff is going to get fixed this year. And if it gets fixed next year, I'll be deeply surprised and I will eat my hat along with the soup. I, I happen to know Gus owns some very, very fancy hats, so I look forward to filming this. But speaking of uh, things that are fancy, NBN Co came up with a, a fancy kind of metric to try and sell people on getting higher speed plans, the Call of Duty download speed metric. Uh, their official quote was something along the lines of uh, that you'd be able to uh, download a Call of Duty update, about 130 gig, in 30 minutes on a high speed plan compared to seven hours on a 50 meg tier. And at first I thought, yeah, look, this is the world's stupidest metric. And then I thought, well, actually, I suppose it does reflect what people actually do. Yeah, I mean, I've I've heard worse ones. And I think what's interesting is that they came up with a metric where it still reminds you that this stuff takes forever, even with a high-speed connection. <laughs> yeah. The fast version of it was taking 30 minutes. This is not super, super exciting. Like I remember the first time I tried out Optus Cable back when it was rolled out in the mid-90s, I was very excited at downloading. I can't remember the size of the file, but it downloaded in 10 seconds flat. And I was amazed and gushed about this when I read about it because it was almost instantaneous. 30 minutes still feels like, oh, blimey, well, I'm just going to go and play something else on the Switch while I wait for that to download. So it was kind of a bit of an own goal in that way, I thought. Well, not that it's on the Switch, but my God, if it was on Nintendo's online infrastructure, that'd be 30 days because this ignores the other reality of all of this stuff that I think people really do need to be aware of, which is the speed that you buy from Emienko is not your full flat out speed that you'll get from every service from now forevermore, because it does depend on the usage of those servers and time of day and all sorts of other factors. Think, you know, buying a Taylor Swift concert ticket, if you want a good recent example of how to melt a server. So if you've got a 100 meg connection, but you're connecting to Sony for PlayStation downloads and they're only sending it out at 10 meg, then it doesn't matter how fast your connection is, you're only going to get it at 10 meg. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It, and it was ever thus. It has always been like that. And while they try and do clever things with CDNs and stuff to speed up those things, they are, yeah, that's what does people in. But at the end of the day, the reality is that what people get annoyed about is when their streaming doesn't work. That's when mm. people actually complain. Like that's when you actually get the big winch happening. Whereas, I, you know, I think there's a resigned sigh when the Call of Duty patch comes out and you just know, well, I'm not doing anything there for a while. So, Alex, it's tax time, which means it's scam time. I hear that you've been receiving some interesting messages. Yeah, so I woke up this morning, which sounds like the intro of a blues song, but bear with, <laughs> bear with me here. I woke up this morning uh, bum, 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 bum. and I had an SMS. Bum, 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 and I'm going to stop singing there because, <laughs> seriously, we're just losing. Someone's probably got the copyright to that. But uh, I looked at my phone and I had a message from the ATO informing me that there was an error in my details and that my refund of a very specific amount of the top matter was like $1,800.17 could not be processed. But hey, they'd provided me with a handy link that I could click to update my details. Isn't that great? That's very I'm, convenient. I'm, I'm a winner here, right? Yeah, they're definitely looking out for you. Yeah, <laughs> except, of course, you know, as uh, hopefully everyone has realized, no, they weren't. This was a scam. And it struck me that it's it's partially a bit of a classic scam, but it's also kind of a smart thing in a way, because while I didn't fall for it, I could 100% see the instance in which I might have. I've just woken up. The coffee hasn't kicked in. There's this message. Perhaps I've just put my tax return in. 
So I'm waiting for it. And I suddenly get this thing, which looks quite credible um, to the untrained, uncaffeinated eye. So I panic and I click on it and I do it because it looks like it's what I've got to do. Bang, they've got me. Yes, it's the classic model because we know that, yeah, scammers will always go for the situational moment. So right now, if that's what's going on, it's like, boom, okay, get in here because you're thinking about tax. And so they're, they're always going to lean into these opportunities and unfortunately, people are going to fall for it. We know that time and time again, while lots of people are aware of it, loads and loads of people are do it. Enough people click on them that they keep sending them. This is the bottom line. It's a very simple and very annoying business model and it's working beautifully for them. And it's, that's, that's disturbing. <laughs> I think the big because the three of us have been writing about this stuff for <laughs> let's say twenty years and change, um, but and the big change in writing about scams over that time is the shift from originally these kind of scams were things about with, that were too good to be true, but now modern scams you are mean more Anna like Kornikova doesn't want to marry me exactly my heart is broken, <laughs> where now you know the Nigerian prince doesn't want to share his gold with me. But now modern scams are more about being too mundane to be fake. Is that yes. a trend you've spotted as well? That's absolutely the way that we've seen these things shift. So that the the classic pattern for scam. I went through, I looked at all the messages that have been automatically moved into the spam folder on my phone because modern phones are actually pretty good at detecting the worst examples. And 95% of them were to say, hey, you forgot to pay this road toll. Now, yeah. this, of course, is fantastically amusing because I don't drive. And everyone, should be very, <laughs> everyone should be very grateful for that fact because it's that single fat dramatically improves road safety. But so I, for me, it's like, well, hey, I know that that one is not true. But the fact is, you know, that's one of those things that everybody has. Everybody has, you know, well, not everybody, a huge percentage of people have an e-tag. And so they think, oh, hang on, maybe I got that wrong. One of the ones that was called out specifically recently by the ACCC as a growth area for scam was around loyalty programs. So it was Qantas Frequent Flyer and Wool and Wool was Everyday Extra. They're saying, "Oh, hey, you know, um, you need to confirm your details." And maybe people don't think of those things as being they don't they're not sensitive the way they would with their bank. But like twelve million Australians are in Qantas Frequent Flyer. There's a really good t- chance you're going to hit that. Yeah. And Frequent Flyer points are worth money. If someone nicks them off you, they can flog them to somebody else. They're absolutely a viable currency. So. It's, it's that combination of go for something that's really common, and we've seen that for years. Back when they were telco scams, it would be Telstra or Optus. They're not going to do one that's going after Southern Phone because the payoff is just not going to be there. Um, and as you say, Adam, it's, about, it's not necessarily about, oh, wow, this is astonishing. It's more like you're either going to get a refund of a reasonable but realistic amount, or it's like, oh, no, otherwise you're going to pay this $50 fine. And yeah. $50 is not enormous, but it's enough for you to think, oh, hey, hang on. I'll try and do something about that. Or well, the big one in the last few years, you missed a parcel delivery, which is, that's just huge because that's practically everyone's been getting stuff delivered online for the last few years. And you do sort of panic and go, yeah, I was waiting for a parcel, click. Yeah. So the danger is absolutely there. And what, what we have seen is that the volume of these things, which is, has really, really gone up because when they shifted from doing voice calls to predominantly doing text, you can just bombard people. I think we did find a research last year where three in four people said, yeah, that they'd received at least one scam text. And even I thought that was a low figure. I thought it should have been more like nine in 10 and the other 10% were just unconscious and hadn't looked at their phones for a while. <laughs> so these things are prolific, as we say. Um, and, you know, we can, we can feel as though we know what to look out for, but a lot of people might not. So, so Gus, what things in these messages are kind of giveaways that they might not be on the level. So the big, the, the big obvious too, the first one is look out for spelling errors. Like genuinely, a lot of these ones have obvious spelling mistakes in them. So now this presumes that you know how to spell, and that's not an assumption <laughs> I make with lots of people these days. But if you do feel vaguely literate, that's a good thing. The second one is take a careful look at the URL because it will be it will not be the right URL and it will often end these days it'll often end in a weird domain. It'll be a dot info or a dot AZ or one of these things you haven't heard about as much. It's less likely to be a dot com. So I think looking at those and thinking they're suspicious is always a good sign. But the bottom line is if you see a message like that, don't respond to it. Even if you think if you really think it's a problem, go and bring that service yourself or log into that service yourself in the normal way and find out if that's the case. Because if the ATO really does owe you a refund, you'll do that. But be cautious about it. Be cautious about it. So but, I'll go uh, a little, I will go a little further than that and say the vast majority of businesses these days are not putting links in SMSs at all if they're legit. The ATO yeah. certainly doesn't. The classic there is you'll just get a thing saying, you have a new message in your MyGov inbox, full stop. That's oh. the whole thing. Yeah. The two giveaways for this one that I got today 
were that they spelt government with a Z in it. And which, yeah, weird. Uh, <clears throat> but also that there was just a, a URL in there. And it was a really weird, bodgy one as well. They weren't even trying to look as though they were my gov. It was something strange. But uh, an SMS with a link in it, to me, is, is almost immediately a, yeah, that's just not legit at all. And there is nearly always another way for these important services for you to look up those details anyway. Yeah. Good tip, good tip. <laughs> when it comes to getting calls, scammy calls, what I find is the biggest indicator is if you start to push back, if you start to say no and they get nasty, they start to threaten you, they start to get aggravated, then that means they're not legit. Yeah. The more that they more they try and push you into doing it, the less legit they are. Because if they are legit and you say, oh, I'm worried about this, I'm not sure it's real, though, a legit one will go, Yeah, okay, fair enough. Perhaps you could do this, perhaps you could do that. If they start threatening to send the cops around or cut your service off or whatever, then they're not legit. Absolutely. And again, the thing is, if you do happen to answer the call, like if it hasn't been flagged as a spammy thing and they start that discussion, what you have to say is, Oh, look, thank you for letting me know that, but for my own security, I'm going to have to ring you back i can't possibly assume this call is legitimate and i would just say that and then stop and like then if you choose to actually want to bring up your bank or whoever it is then do that and again if you say that that's when they'll start screaming at you <laughs> at yeah. that exact point so yeah as a tactic if you are going to answer that phone i understand that some people will go for that i often lean these days into like if it's important they'll leave me a voicemail or they'll send me a text so if i don't know who the number is i'm probably not going to answer it but if you do answer it just yeah just don't, whatever you do, don't give anyone your details. I think this is the ultimate underlying message of both those things is just do not share that information with someone who's from a link that you've clicked or it's just, or when you get a call, just don't do that. It's not worth it. So I could see some people saying, well, hang on, you know, if they get into my MyGov, so what, uh, you know, they can pay my tax bill, ha ha. But the impact of this could be really significant, couldn't it, Gus? Oh, it could be absolutely enormous. Like there are all these estimates of the millions of dollars that Australians lose to scams, and we know that they're all massive underestimates because, in the most generous assessment, about twenty percent of people will report when they get a scam message, and that's at the high level. I think it's more, typically it's more like five percent. So we're talking big amounts of money, and all these uh, the services are connected. My gov, of course, it's not just the fact that you know that can actually it can connect into your medical records because that's yeah. how you get into Medicare as well. So there's significant stuff going on there so like any of these services like you know they have personal information that's valuable even if the account itself is not useful that may create give away information that they can then use to impersonate you to steal your identity so there's a risk in all in almost any service that you've signed up for there is potentially risky information in it so you don't want any of them to get hacked even if your attitude is oh well that's benign i don't care about that i've only got 100 quantas frequent five points what would that possibly be worth to anybody but there's other personal information stored in these accounts and once they've yeah. got hold of that that gives them more access to things and this is you know and if you're yeah if you're like a lot of people and you know your password on all these things is the same you potentially open up a massive pandora's box at that point if you've been carefully using you know Adam Turner is my god. Fifty-seven is your password for everything that you get into. <laughs> once oh, once. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> yeah, you've really. I mean, hopefully these days there's no reason to be that person. Like, it's, if you're using a password management service, the one that's built in with your phone or your browser, then you don't have to have identical passwords. You won't have that problem. But every account that gets hacked into, it's a real risk. So you do need to, yeah, always err on the side of caution. As you say, there's that flow on effect because I'm not sure if I talked about this on the podcast or not. A couple of months ago, I got a charge on my credit card from AGL for $5,000, which is very interesting because I'm not an AGL customer. So <laughs> I rang the bank and said, this wasn't me. And then I rang AGL just to confirm that I'm not a customer. And the bank said they'd stop it going through. And then a couple of days later, AGL tried to take another $1,000 from me. So we had to replace my credit card and go through the whole thing. And what we figured out in the end is that someone had my credit card details and the, the way the scam usually goes is they sign up for an AGL account, they use my credit card to pay a bill or you know, to put some credit into the account and then they withdraw that credit into a different service. So they take it from my credit card into AGL and then from AGL into their offshore account, the Caymans so or whatever. So their money laundering. Yeah, basically. basically yeah. And it's not AGL's fault. Like mm. it could have been anybody, but I was, you know, the fact that A, I'm not an AGL customer and B, how the hell do you get a bill for $5,000 for power, you know? Um, 
the, it's, the, it's well, a gas flare you've got running out yeah. the back of your house 24 so, minutes. But they, they would have got my detail because I'm pretty mm. careful with th- this kind of stuff doesn't happen to me very often. So what I'm thinking is they've got my details from somewhere else. I am a Medibank private customer. So no, I've, no. Yeah. I've <laughs> got a feeling that maybe I got caught up in that because I think I did get an email from them saying, this was exposed, but not that. But as we know, you can't really trust what they said in the end because they kept changing their story about whose details were revealed and what was revealed. But I would, I'm would i going on the assumption that something like I got caught up in something like that, then my details got sold off, then these people bought my details for 10 bucks on the dark web or whatever and then just went to AGL and signed me up. But not under my name, under their name, but with my card. Right. And, that's, and that creates that stuff. And it's so hard to do the forensics on this even when you're in a good position. Mm. I remember being in a similar position where, um, and again, this was this was not a credit card scam. This is where suddenly I logged into my Velocity Frequent Flyer. I thought, hang on, that's a lot less points than I'm supposed to have, and realized that somebody else had managed to book a flight between um, Singapore and Beijing Ooh. on one of Virgin's partner airlines, and all the points are gone. And I knew I hadn't done this. And in fact, I knew that I could prove if push came to shove that I was in an entirely different country at the time this happened. But I had to go through the ringer with Virgin to get it sorted. And I went through the whole process. And it took it literally took about two months to get this order. Then after that, I contacted Virgin as a journalist to say, "Well, can you explain what went on here?" Because I was, and they went through. Oh no, we think you know you just you, you used this in an internet cafe. And I said, "Look, I'm a tech journalist. I'm not yeah. that dumb." <laughs> <laughs> um, my suspicion in that case is actually there was an internal problem. I think because their systems are also mm. accessible to travel agents and things like that. I think someone else worked out how to manipulate it like that. But ultimately, they don't really want you to know. That at a certain point, if you can get the problem resolved. They just kind of go, okay, we'll try and solve this internally, but we don't want the publicity of this being bad. Obviously, in the case of Virgin, I wrote a story about it because I wasn't about to let that one lie. But And then they sort of complained and said, well, that was very unfair. And I said, well, if I've published the comments you gave me about it. If you don't want to give me more detail, that's not really my fault. Uh, anyway, uh, but this is the thing. It can happen to anybody. Like We think of ourselves as technically savvy individuals, but and we do all the right things, but nothing absolutely protects you. And that's why you have to remain alert and keep an eye on your credit card. And when those $5,000 bills come in go well hang on yeah i know power bills are going up but not by that much that weren't me <laughs> and actually this is a really really important point because we kind of said oh look you know there's no excuse for using the same passwords and you've got to be careful and so on but it is just as important if not more important if this does happen to you and as i said at the start if i'd been a little more tired and i had been waiting on a tax return i could see myself having stupidly clicked on that link and i'm sure it would have brought me to a site which looked like the mygov site Everything else might have seemed fine if I didn't look at the URL and so on. If this happens to you, it's actually kind of important not to feel ashamed about it. By all means, feel angry, get angry, get outraged, get fixing the problem. But as you said before, Gus, it's something like 20% of people report this. It's not a high percentage, which means we don't really know the full scope of the problem. And one of the best ways we can deal with this, and one of the reasons I wanted this to be one of our topics on the show this week is because it needs as much light on it as possible. People need to know because knowing will help them think about it the next time it hits them. But the more people who go, oh, well, I've been fooled. I'll just hang my head in shame but not mention it. Then nobody knows and fewer people act. Absolutely. So it's just one of those things here. Be aware, be alert, um, don't be alarmed. Do not click on mygov.adamturner and you'll be fine. But also it's one of those things where you might know enough to think I'd never fall from that for, for that, but your friends and relatives might not. So there's mm-hmm. a bit of an education play there as well. You know, if your, you know, parents are of a generation that our parents are, then they're very likely to fall for some of this stuff. Yeah. But equally, you know, it's 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 kind of easy to paint the seniors as as non tech savvy, and some of them are and some of them are not. But Equally, it can happen to the young and arrogant. Oh, yeah, I'm oh, not I'm saying it can't happen. To, to They're the only ones. Yeah. But, yeah. It, you know, a, a people of a, a younger persuasion have a little bit of a responsibility to help their elder relatives perhaps recognise. Absolutely. Oh, educating everyone is the ideal yeah. here to, to try and minimise the impact because the impact is huge. I looked up Scamwatch's stats on this for just for identity theft, just for this year, their estimate is over $35 million. Oof. And if that's only 20% of the total that people have lost just to identity theft, then this is a big, big, lucrative, horrible business. Well, that just about wraps up this week's episode of Vertical Hold. Thanks to Gus for joining us this week. Pleasure, as always. 
And we have mixed things up here at Vertical Hold. No more three questions of doom. Instead, you can promote anything you like. It can be your where you work, your social media, something you think people should do. And the contentious thing of the week, what colour shirt, top, blouse, or otherwise body covering should our listeners wear tomorrow? Okay, so people can find my writings variously on finder.com.au and my more esoteric stuff at angus.kidman.show. Um, you can't go wrong with red. So I'm just going to say, when in doubt, wear red because it's like a red rag to a bull or in this case to the dog. We can hear barking in the background. <laughs> and as always, while Adam goes to uh, muffle the sounds of a barking dog, you can catch us online at Vertical Hold AU on the artist formerly known as Twitter the Vertical Hold Facebook page, Instagram, and on the web at verticalhold.com.au. Thanks, everyone, for dropping by. Let us know how you've done in the NBN lottery. Let us know how you pick up on scams and just let us know what you think of the show. Vertical Hold is proudly brought to you by Uniden Australia. Scam, 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 sc